Good afternoon. Welcome to our second annual Easter pageant called Glorious Day. And what this pageant seeks to do is from the Holy Scriptures, present an adapted version of Christ's ministry, his death, his resurrection, and ultimately his glorification. For there is no greater news in all the earth that Jesus saves. And what Easter really is about is not bunnies, not Easter eggs, but we have a risen Savior who died to save all who believe in him and their sins. Now before we actually get started, just a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, if you, for any reason, need to use the restroom, please exit through those double doors there and immediately turn left, my left here. And the women's restroom is on the left and the men's restroom is down the hall on the left as well. Also, at this time, we would ask if you could please silent your phones. Come out right, get it. Please put your cell phones on silent. Um, the reason being is the cast put a lot of time into this and it would be distracting if the cell phone rang through the service. Also distract from your enjoyment of the presentation. So with that being said, it is my privilege and pleasure to present to you Glorious Day. Before we get started, will you guys all join me in prayer? Father, we know what Easter is all about. That Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross, endured the full wrath of the Father, and rose victoriously on the third day. He's alive. No other religion has a founder who passed through death and lives never to die again. That's what validates Christianity's truth, that Christ lives, that he was seen by over 500 witnesses, that history and the scriptures Verify that he truly is alive. He truly is the Son of God. And he is the only one by whom the sins of the world can be taken away. So, Father, as we betray the gospel of Christ, I pray, Father, that our hearts and our minds be open, that you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Different. No, I'm, I'm not a Roman. I'm a Jew. Well, that explains it. 
Leave me alone. I'm nothing to you. Calm down. I only meant that you're the one I've heard the other prisoners talking about. I've heard many incredible stories about you. Such as? Well, I heard that you've been arrested before and that you've escaped. And I heard that you even raised a woman from the dead. There are quite a few wild stories going around about you. Well, those stories are true. What? Yes, all of those things really happened. But to be perfectly honest with you, they all pale in comparison to another event that took place in my life. What could be more incredible than raising someone from the dead? Meeting Jesus. I don't understand. Well, if I hadn't met Jesus, none of those other things would have been possible. He's the one that gave me all the talents and abilities to do all of those other things. So who is this Jesus? Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my Savior. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God? Which God? Neptune? Jupiter? I've never heard of this Jesus. No, not one of the many gods of Rome. The true God. The only God. His Son, Jesus, came to earth. And he came to me while I was fishing on the Sea of Galilee with my brother Andrew. That day was the beginning of my life. Let me tell you about the most amazing man that I've ever met and how he changed my life. Trust me. 
Pardon me, but aren't you Jesus' mother? Why, yes, I am. You are? Well, I'm so long, and I've been following your son's teachings for the past few weeks. And I was in Galilee when he called Peter and Andrew to be his disciples. You know, I know there's something really special about him, and I was hoping you could help me and find out what it is. He, is he the Messiah, or is he just another great rabbi? He is not just another rabbi. He is my son. But is he the Messiah? It is as you say. He is the Son of the Most High. Oh, really? Well, how, how are you sure? How do you know that? I was visited by an angel before Joseph and I were married. I was so afraid when he showed up that the angel told me not to be. He said I found favor with God. He went on to tell me that I was to give birth to a son and I was to call him Jesus. He said that Jesus would be great and that he would be called Son of the Most High and that he would be king. And that his kingdom shall never end. You said that you and Joseph weren't married yet. How are you going to have a baby? Well, that was my question exactly. The angel into the Holy Spirit will come upon me, and the power of the Most High will overshadow me. So the one to be born will be called the Son of God. This is God's child. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. That's incredible. Oh, I have so many questions to ask. He said Jesus is coming to the city right now and people are pouring palm branches on the pad. Let's go see. Let's go see right now.
grieving with the kids. But this woman, from the time I met her, does not stop kissing my feet. She did not put oil on my head, as is the custom. She is poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, her many sins are forgiven, for she loved much. But you, who have forgiven little, love me little. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith is saved. Go in peace.
and the money given to the poor, it was worth a year's wages. It was intended she should save her name to the dad my Mary. You will always have the poor money. You will not always have me. Do you think he understands what he's saying? He can be the one to change all this. I mean, he can overthrow the Pharisees. He can bring us away from Rome. I mean, he's the Messiah. But he keeps talking about dying. How many times has he mentioned that? At least three different times. How can he rescue us if he's dead? He speaks nonstop about the cost of following him. But everywhere we go, people worship him and they hang on his every word. I mean, what could happen to him with all these people around him? They love him. What kind of cost could there be wherever where we go to worship him? You know, I've been wondering the same thing for weeks. And I don't understand it either, but it seems that he knows something we don't. Do you not realize that it's better for you that one man dies 
for the people than the whole nation of perish? Gentlemen, our solution must be permanent. Yes, you're right. It must be permanent. You can't be serious. You're talking about it as a man. But not there in the festival. Whatever you're planning, we got to do something different. We'll have a riot among the people if we do this now. But he's done nothing wrong. Joseph, if you were not committed to your responsibilities as a Sanhedrin and our very existence of way of life, perhaps you should just leave. Yeah. If things go well, we would have Jesus try and convict him before Passover and Jesus. Excellent. Well then, gentlemen, good night and sleep well. Tomorrow promises to be a very good day.
Are you that prophet from Nazareth? Are you the one they could call the king? You know, I've heard some things about you. Why, even my wife has saw you in her nightmares. Who are you? Are you the king of kings? Are you the king they've been waiting for? Is that your idea? Or have others talked to you about me? But do you think I'm a Jew? It was your own people and your own high priest that brought you to me. So what is it that you're supposed to have done anyway? My kingdom is not in this world. If it were my servants to fight for them, my arrest. Oh, my kingdom is from another place. Oh, you, you are a king. You are right to say I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. For this reason I came to this world. Testify the truth. Everyone who stands on the side of the truth follows me. What is the truth? I find no basis for the charges against this man. But as customary during the time of Passover, I will release to you a prisoner. Uh, whom do you choose? Is this prophet from Nazareth or Barabbas? Yeah, Barabbas. I didn't want to hear what he was saying. 
I didn't want to believe that it would really happen, but it is happening. Well, what are you talking about? They sentenced him to death. What? Oh. The Sanhedrin doesn't have that authority. I know. They had Pilate do it. I followed the mob last night. Pilate sentenced Jesus to be crucified. Father, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. 
hands that healed patients stretched out on a tree. He took the nails for me. Why do you 
think I'm in prison. I've lived a life I am not proud of, and I've hurt many people. God just doesn't love someone like me. Faustus, it doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you. His son died for you. He can and will wash your sins away. And he'll cast him as far away as the east is from the west. He died for me. He loves me. Peter, I believe you. I believe the truth. I believe in Jesus.
Because you and I, apart from Christ, are enemies of God. Every time you do something that is against God's law, it's an act of treason against the creator and king of the universe. You see, God is the sovereign one who spoke and all things came into existence. He is the king of the universe. And every time you do anything, you say anything, you don't do something that dishonors him, it's an act of treason against his rule and reign. You and I are his enemies. We have broken his laws. We have transgressed his commands. And every sin against the infinite God warrants an infinite punishment. Now let's ask why again. Say why? 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 Why an infinite punishment? Why is hell forever? What, in order to understand that, we have to understand what justice really is. In justice, the punishment must always fit the crime. And so how you measure that is the crime itself and whom the crime is against. Let me give you an illustration from our society. If I go up to someone and just hit them in the nose, so the average person on the street, what's going to happen to me? Charges will probably be pressed. I may spend the night in prison or jail. Now let's say I go up to a cop and I hit him in the face. I'm going to spend more time in jail and the charges will be greater. Now let's say I go up to President Obama and smack him in the face. What's going to happen to me? I'm going to spend a lot of time in jail. Now let's say I go to North Korea and hit the ruler of North Korea in the face. I'm probably going to be shot on sight. Why did the punishment change based on who I offended? Why? Because the punishment must fit the crime. And the greater the power of the one you offend, the greater the punishment. When you offend God, when you commit treason by dishonoring him with our thoughts, our actions, our words, our inaction, you commit treason against the highest of all beings. Therefore, it warrants the highest of all punishments, an infinite hell. Just as God is infinite, those who offend him will receive an infinite punishment. That's what makes what Christ did all more profound. You see, there's a physical suffering on the side of the cross. But there's a spiritual suffering that we know nothing about. You see, Jesus was our propitiation for sin. And what that essentially means is he endured the wrath of God for the sins of his people. He paid your sin debt. Think of it like this. Every time you sin, it's like incurring a debt before God. And Jesus took your sin debt, nailed on the cross, and he said it's finished. That basically means it is paid in full for all those who believe. He took God's justice for your sin upon himself. That's profound. That's profound. But how do we receive such a great gift? I mean, how does God apply what His Son did on the cross to us? By faith. Romans 3, very clear, it's by faith. Now, can I get a volunteer? Real quick. Don't raise your hands at once. I need one volunteer. Come on. One brave soul. I'll call you out if I get a volunteer. Yes, come on. Let me ask, do you trust me? Okay. Just pray. She's really brave. All right, what I'm going to ask you to do is turn around, please. Hold your arms up. And if I say on three, I'm going to count to three, and then just fall back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. At what point did she truly trust me? Was she professed as she was walking? Up, that she trusted me, or was it when she fell back? When she let go, it's when she let go. That's what faith is, is letting go of your sin, letting go of living life for yourself, letting go of your good works to try to please God, which the Bible calls filthy rags, and just falling into the arms of Jesus. Resting in what Christ did on the cross alone to save you from your sins. That is faith. Essentially, it's you coming to God and saying, I can't bring anything to the table, but what your son accomplished on the cross. I'm resting in him. So as we get ready to see our last scene, I want to ask you again, why? Why would you be here today and reject such great love? Why would you leave here today still condemned and doomed in your sins? And why would you be concerned more about what others may think if in a moment you come forward other than what God thinks?
Mark 8, Jesus says some pretty stinging words. He said, if you're ashamed of me before this perverse and evil generation, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the angels of heaven. Why not give your life to Christ today and make it public? Forsaking all the rest of him. I'm going to pray in a moment we're going to have an invitation. We're going to sing just as I am. I'm going to encourage you to forsake sin and fall to the arms of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for those here today who are believers. I pray as they saw a portrait or picture of the gospel that they're encouraged and their faith is strengthened. I pray, Father, for those who don't know you today through relation to Jesus Christ. God, they will let go of living life for themselves. They will let go of their sin and they will fall into the arms of Jesus who will hold them up for all eternity and present them blameless before you and your throne. Father, the altar will be open in a moment. I pray for the courage of those in your calling to publicly profess that they're unashamed to follow Jesus and they don't care what anyone thinks. God, may your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It's unimaginable. Father, we're grateful that we have a future that awaits us. I can't even describe a few words perfectly. And I pray, Father, as we do this last scene, that many will be encouraged. And for those who may not know you, they'll see what they're missing. For Father, we're not headed for heaven. We're headed for everlasting destruction. God, we love you and are grateful for this picture of the future. See Christ in your prayer. Amen. <laughs>
faith family here at First Baptist Church, thank you for coming to our second annual Easter pageant. As you would join me in giving our cast, Charlotte, our piano player, our sound team, our lighting team, a hand. That would be a